Uh, my name is Russell Medford. I'm the, uh, one of the co-owners for the Artitude Gallery in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, and we're pleased to inaugurate our Artist of the Month series with uh, Robert Asman. Uh, uh, we are honored to uh, represent Robert, uh, who moved to Asheville about seven years ago, is that correct? Six years. Six years ago, after uh, an extended time uh, and the development of a, an outstanding career in, in the great city of Philadelphia. Uh, he's an accomplished artist uh, who uh, utilizes uh, extraordinary darkroom technique, uh, both the chemistry and physicality, to create uh, one-of-a-kind pieces that he's going to go through today after giving an introduction of where he's come from. Uh, he's a, a stat, an accomplished lecturer. Uh, he's taught at Moore, uh, Moore College of Art and Design, the Drexel University, University of Arts, and the University of Pennsylvania. And his work can be found uh, hanging in the Contemporary Art uh, in Philadelphia Institute, the Gallery Pavillon in Paris, and in the permanent collections of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Library of Congress in Washington, and the Smithsonian uh, American Art Museum in Washington as well. Uh, we're delighted to uh, welcome uh, Robert Asman. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Russell. <laughs> now, <laughs> photography is not all art. <clears throat> photography works on very many levels. And I've worked with photography on almost every level. And in fact, I, when I began photography, it wasn't even considered an art. And I never even thought it to be an art. I thought it was, it was basically a craft. It was almost close to a sport because I did a lot of photojournalism. I did a lot of annual report work. And the concept of that was timing for the most part. And I used to also you know, play a lot of sports in Ohio. That's what you do out there. But, you know, that's how I kind of looked at photography. It's a timing thing, it's an athletic thing in the whole nine yards. So I learned how to be a good printmaker. You know, I could work fast, I could work quick, and I could get the prints out the door and put the feet put them in their hands and get some money right away. But at the same time, I was also, you know, going to the camera clubs and, you know, people like Robert Frank and, you know, all the people out in San Francisco started developing photography as a very serious art form. But it was kind of segued more with poetry than the visual arts. You know, when photography came around, you know, no one really kind of thought of that as an art form in itself. It wasn't until, you know, Minor White and John Sarkowski and some of those real leaders came about to the Museum of Modern Art that was ever introduced to the public. After doing all the people photographs in Washington and the annual report stuff and all that, I started saying, I'm not doing commercial photography anymore. <clears throat> I refused. I figured it's all art and poetry. And that's what I'm sticking to. But I did decide that, you know, people needed to have good prints made of their work. And so that was the element that I was always good at. And I really could tolerate being alone for long periods of time in a dark room, especially if there was good music. <laughs> <laughs> and so that became my thing. And, you know, I did a lot of work for the Washington Post. And then when I got to Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Youth Choir. And then all sorts of artists that I've printed for over the years, and I still do it. I was working for someone last night. But anyway, this was the first polio that Paul Cava did. And the way this worked, it was in a small edition. He did about seven or other eight artists now, and they all go for a very good price at auction because they were so rare and endemic of the time, actually. But these were basically six images representing the the work I was doing where I kind of refused to use people, where I decided to use trees as metaphors for people instead. So, and I printed them with a nice hazy lights and larger and came up with a real interesting toning technique, which is a combination of selenium and bleach, which I still use today. which was just recent, that's from Philadelphia, 1978, that was just recently taken down and replaced with something. And this was always my marijuana tree, which I thought was very special. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it's very special. <laughs> Did you put it to good use? <laughs> no, we just admired it. <laughs> Things at this point in time in particular, 
I just wanted to see what the image would look like and how it would come out on paper. And at the same time, although I did color and you know, we used to have to work with different lights and filter packs and things like that, color is not as enjoyable. And I, yeah, I realized that right from the get-go because it didn't have a tactile feeling to it. Because what I realized too with photography is that what I really loved is not the, uh, the methods, but the, the sensuality of it. I like to have my hands and I like to see how it felt. And, you know, along with the sensuality came the whole tactility. And so that, with the whole idea of tactility, then I would think, how can I make this film grainier? And so it has more of a touch, which is more sculptural. And then I would play with, you know, making the film, you know, just very grainy, that type of thing. And then I came across the idea, why not start working with paper? <laughs> you know, so instead of using film, I started tearing up the paper. And there are plenty of samples of that in this gallery <laughs> as we speak, like Gary said to this. This comes from using paper and masking the negative itself with the paper. And, you know, I brought some negatives along for people who aren't familiar with photography. <laughs> some idea or concept of what I'm in fact talking about. Okay. Now this image right here, you know, that, that Russell put out, which is really nice, you know, really came from a straightforward image, you know, done in the studio, just on a small piece of paper like this. And then once I had that in the dark room, if anyone's familiar with dark room process, you make a contact sheet, which is like a negative of the positive. So you put another piece of paper down and get a piece of paper like this. And so when I got a piece of paper like this. And, you know, I put this in the enlarger, and basically it just looked flat, a little gray, distorted. There wasn't much happening. I guess that's not going to work out for something else another time. So I, you know, kind of put it aside. And then after a while, and I had all this paper kicking around. And I decided, you know, how can I get texture into this thing? So sure enough, this RC paper, which is called resin coated, which came out after fiber paper, which is a modern concoction, comes in layers of pulp. And so I realized, or in playing around, or just kind of horsing around, I started tearing the paper. You know, which I, I love working with my hands. That's that kind of person. I always subject my thoughts and feelings and emotions to my physicality and sensuality. <laughs> and I realized I could take the paper off and create, you know, another surface, and I could put the negative actually right on top of that, and therefore get a pattern here, which would also marble the image and kind of soften it. But that wasn't exactly, there were a couple, at first it didn't work, you know, but it was getting closer. And then I realized that the whole concept has to do with the, uh, the last thing the light goes through is the texture you're going to pick up. And so, now what I love about Atfield amongst a lot of things are the way the clouds just hang in the air. <clears throat> I'm just so sensitive to the clouds. And to me, they're almost metaphorical bodies. <clears throat> you know, I see them working hand in hand. And in fact, they print very similar to the way the light goes through them and reflects off of them. And, you know, they're also a very neutral palette to work with. You know, it's not like you have to um, be worried about any politic or, you know, statement or anything else. You know, I would complain about the clouds. So. <laughs> So it's a metaphor for the human body in the clouds. No, it's not really. And I or don't want it to be. You know what? I just want it to be a cloud. <laughs> I think that's fine. Sometimes it doesn't a cloud have, is just a cloud. <laughs> that's exactly how I look at it. I cigar went into some detail detail just a cigar. Yeah, I got it. You know? But at the same time, the form, you know, does very much resemble. It has an anthropomorphic feel about it, you know, which does right. very much resemble the human form. You know? or angels, or something of the sort. 
But so, with all that being said, that I'm not, you know, I don't consider the clouds bodies. I do sort of consider them heavenly bodies. He once commented to me that uh, Richard Marish, I think, who we uh, saw a couple months ago, went, went through his career where he was doing trees in the desert, or cactus. Yeah. Oh, I, and in fact, I know how he was printing them when we were talking at the time. You know, Paul Cava had a great gallery back then. That was in the 70s and 80s. There were only about a half dozen people that really thought photography would become an art form. You know, invested in having galleries was a period. You know, there was Light Gallery up in New York. There was old Franco out in San Francisco. But I think there were only about a half dozen. And Robert Miller Gallery, he got very interested. Uh -huh. And I remember, oh, what's his name? Now he runs the gallery. But he used to come down to Philadelphia all the time for the shows. And he started signing artists like Lee Friedlander and uh, had Diane Arbus's work and all that. You know, all these guys that are legends. <laughs> and, you know, I can go on to that for days, you know. <laughs> But, you know, I was so fortunate for UTC, too, when Harry won, you know, decided not to sell real estate anymore, but to start selling photographs. And, because he took on Ansel Adams' work, and did the first edition, you know, that and at that time, Robert Maplethorpe came out, you know, from New York and had all his amazing work. <laughs> always, I don't but, even once, talk about this much anymore, but I've always considered the environment I live with my studio, you know, the outside studio. So I shoot outdoors quite a bit you know, just with landscape work and that type of thing. And so I've been doing quite a bit of just, uh, I would say, photographs around Asheville. Oh. You know, these are very straightforward, totally opposite of everything else. Once again, it's the opposites. When I'm uh -huh. doing something that's very complicated, then I'll do something that's very simple. Right. Those are your prints. Yeah, but so these are straight prints. They're, they're relatively straight, but they're still, the toning on them is uh, splenium, um, you know, and bleached and sepia. So they have a warm and toned feel to them. I should pull them out this plastic. I should do. Uh, they, they look good in the yeah, Okay. Beautiful. But no, these are really fine prints, but, but they aren't experimental or there's nothing. Right. You know, they're very controlled as opposed to right. letting the process control it too. Right. In fact, with a lot of these, I started out by doing an awful lot of abstracting and brushing the chemistry on and, and trying the chemicalizations and all that. And I thought, I don't, I'm not ready to do that, this work now. Plus, I'm not sure if it's appropriate. I just kind of like the feeling of, you know, Asheville being a place to maybe sheltering in place. <clears throat> and how about color? Have you ever done color photography? Oh, yeah. I have to, but you know, I've always done color photography for rudimentary you know, that's a wonderful point. And, you know, the, the portfolio I showed you earlier, I mean, that was an addition of 25, and there were, you know, what, three artist proofs and two gallery proofs or one printer's proof or something like that. But I printed them all, and, you know, not one's going to be alike. Right. But that's how Gemini editions, that's how all the big print houses that did lithographs for the artists, you know, right. of their time, from Nikuni to Picasso to all of them, that's how they worked. Uh -huh. And there was a variability going on because it was, that's what handmade means is that, you know, the element of the hand in there can produce beautiful things and magical, you know, coincidences and happenstances or, as I like to say, collusions of opposites. But at the same time, you know, it also will make mistakes and you have to throw things out. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I think that whole happenstance that you bring up is so important, but I do see it, it's so out of favor today because everything has to be, you know, produced to a T of, you right. know, what you are envisioning in your mind. You know, that was an art thing that Ansel Adams used to talk about a whole lot, which I, you know, already thought a musician would ever say, you know, and that's, you got to pre-visualize the finished print all the time. You know? And, you know, I thought, wow, if you had to pre-visualize, why do you even want to bother? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going this whole way to get something exactly right. But that's where his thing was, is the musical score, right. which was how it was brought to life. Mm. Okay. Well, this was wonderful, Robert. Thank you so much. And uh, inaugurating our uh, Artists of the Month series. Thank oh, you. I'm so glad I could do it.